Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison, former NFL player, now climbing the seven summits, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. Okay, look, seven, eight years ago, I had to step into the fear and put a big-ass goal out there, and so I decided to start climbing all these crazy mountains around the world. It's been an absolute amazing journey, and you know I can't believe I'm saying this, but I've actually done six of the seven. I've actually been on Denali twice. I've been on uh, climb successfully Kilimanjaro twice, but now it's Mount Everest, the biggest boy on the block, 29,000 plus, and I'm headed over there April 2020, and I'm totally keyed up. And I'm keyed up because I've been doing all this preparation. I, I train like an absolute bear, and um, really putting myself in a position of success. I'm going to be climbing with one of the top um, climbing outfitters in the world. Excited about that. And uh, just, you know, the mountain has fascinated me for years, I'm sure, like others. But uh, really excited to do so. And so if I can actually pull this thing off, I'd be the first NFL player to do so. And so as we speak today, there's not that many first in the world. So uh, I look forward to tackling that. Okay, so that's one. Two is I totally appreciate the listen uh, on these different podcasts. I really do. And uh, it's been an amazing journey, as I said, uh, from um, not just interviewing these people, but being on the other side of the, the, the mic and really taking in their incredible stories of doing amazing things. And look, we all need to be inspired. And so if I can help provide and find more people that meet that criteria, all the better. And uh, it just, we all need that, that, uh, that motivation, and we all need that, those words of encouragement that you can make it back relevant to your own situation, and then plow forward in whatever endeavor you are trying to do. Okay, so I appreciate that, and uh, if you want to find out anything that I have going on, you can do so at markpattisonnfl.com. I've got a book out now called Finding Your Summit, Go Figure. And it is essentially the playbook to uh, what I had learned from my Hall of Fame coaches uh, on how to emerge and do some uh, great things in your life. It doesn't have to be mountain climbing, of course. It can be anything, but it's it's you know it's it's a plug in that you 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 take on these different these different things, these different goals, that these different strategies that that I've set forth, uh, that they set forth for me. And good things can come from that. Okay. Also on the website, you can find out more about my expedition. Obviously, I'm be going to I'll be going to to Mount Everest, and we'll have more information about that coming up. There's an e-learning course, and of course, the podcast. And when you go to the podcast, you will find an iTunes tab. And I would be so grateful if you go in and you'd rate and review. Now, uh, it all has to do with visibility, popularity of podcasts, because there's so many podcasts out there today that it's so easy to get lost and like, way, where's Finding Your Summit? And uh, I think I really do believe these stories are, are really amazing and, and incredible and can really give a lift to those people who really need it. Uh, and even if you don't, we all need to be motivated and, and uh, inspired by other people to keep going. So if you'd go in and do that, I would be really, really appreciative. Okay, so look at, let's go listen to the pod. It's going to be awesome. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another very, very, very exciting episode of uh, Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this week, I continue to be on my role in terms of talking to fellow mountaineers. In this case, this guy had an incredibly intense experience on Mount Everest. He's climbed many of the same summits I have been on myself. And so we share that uh, common bond. Uh, but I want to, first of all, introduce Brian Dickinson. Brian, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I know. This is great. Listen, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can go with this pod. And I was thinking about this earlier. And you wrote a book based on what happened to you on Mount Everest called Blind Descent. And this all had to do with a lot of just pretty intense things going all wrong for you on summit day. And the reason why uh, this is so topical right now is because of this gigantic mess that we've been uh, watching unfold here on Mount Everest in the last couple of weeks. My tent mate uh, from Antarctica, by, a guy by the name of Don Cash, he was one of the first Americans. Well, there's two Americans to, to, to pass on the mountain. 
But, um, you know, unfortunately, yeah, I know. It was such a bummer. He's such a good guy. And, you know, the, and the, the, the irony out of all this is that, and we're going to get into more depth on, on all this, how this played out for you, but there's just some people that are meant to be on the mountain. I think you're one of those guys and there's, there's, uh, there's others that shouldn't. And Don was one of those guys. I had uh, privately mentioned this to a number of people in my private circles that Don would either lose his life or lose more fingers and toes, which he had done the year before on, on, on Denali. He had a lot of issues down in, in uh, Antarctica, and I don't think I was the only one in that group. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it was the perfect storm in his situation. And you put on top of that, he's not a strong climber. And then you get this mess and then you, you run into these log jams and then people can't get out of them. Something mm-hmm. that, you know, you had to do, but just, I don't know. I mean, before we get into your story, do you have any quick thoughts about what's going on right now on, Ever- on Everest? Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, uh, it, it's crazy because you'll find this after you, you have the experience of Everest, you'll become the resident expert potentially, yep. you know, I'm on the short list for like the today show calls me, wanted me, wanted to fly me into New York to talk about this stuff. And, it's unfortunate. Like I'd, I'd rather talk about, uh, you know, happy, you know, like exciting yeah. things, things that are going right. But at the same time, you need a voice that's been there and actually been through a survival situation. And the press latches on to the, the bad stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's typical. It's the drama. Uh, sorry. It's the drama that you're talking it's, about. It is the drama. No, you're right. And it's unfortunate because the mass majority of people that are there are good, strong climbers. It's their life dream. There's guides, there's Sherpa. You're always going to have a few bad apples. It's, it's going to happen. And, you know, they put themselves, they put others at risk. That's one piece. There weren't that many more permits than there are on a normal season. The weather was just incredibly bad this year. So you only have a couple of days that you can climb the mountain. Unfortunately, May 23rd was one of those and they wedged them all in. You know, Garrett, or not, I don't know if Garrett Madison summited that day or if it was later, but there was a few groups. I, I think he actually did that morning. You know, super strong, great guy, a lot of success. You know, they started fast, they're, they're moving efficient, they're up and down before they really hit the, the massive queue. Yeah. But unfortunately, up in the death zone, on a perfect day, it's survival. When you add extra hours and trying to ne- negotiate around climbers that are not moving, it's tough, you know, and I had a completely different experience, but lower on the mountain, I did have to pass, you know, a, an Indian group that, you know, I had to check to make sure they were alive. They just weren't moving. But when you don't have enough air, you know, it's just, it takes a long time to do things and it's dangerous to clip around someone, especially on Lhotse Face, where it's just, you know, a straight up wall climb. Yeah. So I can't even imagine up there where you have 2,000 or uh, two miles of drop on each side of you and basically two feet wide through that cornice traverse trying to pass people up and down it's just yeah it's unfortunate but it's, it's it's a mountain and people want to climb it and it's getting more popular just climbing in general and it's it's a beautiful thing it's great but you got to figure things out because people are dying and you got to limit the amount of people that can go but you know like i said it's it, the number of permits weren't much larger than they are in a normal season. It was just unfortunate the weather that wedged them all into that one day. Yeah, no, I totally get that. You know, I I, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, they're talking about roughly 3% of people that go up on Everest every year uh, pass. And, And so if you start running the numbers, pretty much the numbers that played out this year are the numbers that, you know, are based on the percentage. And so what... You know, my my MO has always been is I'm going to do everything I can to be the strongest guy on the mountain. And pretty much on all the mountains I've been on so far, I'm not saying there's somebody that like you, you're a total stud, you've got this background we'll get into. But there are other guys certainly that are as strong, but nobody is stronger. And that's because of the process. And that's because of the time that that I put in. And I know you probably put in to put yourself in a position that when things go wrong, you can like, you know, mentally and physically get your way out of those tough, tough places. And uh, I think that, you know, when you start to do that, that increases your odds. And so there's other, other people and every mountain, every single one I've been on, there's always been a weak link, um, either on my party, which there's always been one, or 
other guys on the mountain and they just, you know, looking at these people and just going, you shouldn't be here in the first place. And so anyways, I'm, I'm kind of rifting a little bit right now just because I am going there in 10 months. And, sure. um, you know, I, I want to do everything I possibly can to increase my chances of, of not even so much a summit, but, you know, that's the ultimate goal, but just survival and making sure that if things go wrong, I've got that extra stuff in my tank that I can keep going and, and, and persevere. So let's get into your story. So let's go back just a little bit and then we'll kind of wind our way up. Uh, you have climbed now the seven summits, I believe. You've been all over the world climbing a bunch of different things. Let's start with where did your love of the mountains come from? Um, well, I grew up in Southern Oregon and in the eighties, you know, being a kid, we didn't have all the technology, social media, you know, phones, everything. So it was like, no matter what the weather was, my parents said, you know, go outside, get out of here, you know, go, go seek some adventure. And, you know, just living in the mountains down there, I think it just kind of instilled that in me. Yep. And then from there, I went in the military and I was, you know, helicopter rescue swimmer. I was jumping out of helicopters for a living. So I think the adventure has just always been there. And it wasn't until um, the early 2000s that I moved up to the Seattle area, got, you know, got married, got out of the Navy. And, you know, there's Mount Rainier right here, the Cascades, and I just, I stepped it up a bit, you know, heard about the seven summits, not too many people had done it. So I'm like, hey, that sounds like a great goal. Well, it's a big goal, right? And I was first inspired from the seven summits years ago. Uh, I was actually uh, fortunate to be invited down to uh, Steve Young's uh, charity event in Park City. Actually, it wasn't Park City, it was Snowbird. And the guy that owned the mountain was Dick Bass. And Dick Bass yeah. and uh, another gentleman who were the first guys, actually his, his climbing partner didn't make it, but uh, Dick was the first guy to ever invent this whole mm -hmm. you know, seven summit thing going around the world. And boy, it's been such a great adventure. And uh, you know, not everything has been successful. Denali I had to do uh, twice. And you know, who knows what, what lies ahead for me with the mountain coming up. But you, my, my, my sense is that you probably went in the some kind of chronological path waiting in, in for, for Evis to tackle last? Is that how your path went? No, no, not necessarily. It was um, for me, you know, because these things are expensive. You know, I had really young kids at the time. So I was trying to balance all that and work yep. and everything else. So it was about finding sponsors, um, finding the right people to climb with. So I've climbed the seven summits. I've never summited Denali. I've been within a thousand feet. I snowboarded it once. So I'm, I'm not official. Yeah. And part of my journey has been being able to accept that, that, you know, I could go and just go after it every single year if I wanted to. But how much is that taken away from my, my family? And, you know, what's it doing to me? So never say never, but it's, it's just one of those things, you know, I may end up back there when my son's older and we do it together. Or maybe, you know, you just never know. So went to Denali first then hit Kelly, Elbrus in the same year. And then Everest was actually my fourth. And it was just, it was basic, basically just opportunity. You know, I knew a guy who had a guiding company that could outfit me. I went independent, so I didn't actually go guided. Uh, but I had Sherpa support to, you know, a certain extent. And it was just a, a very unique, unique scenario. So it wasn't part of a larger group. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because um, after researching your story, I was trying to understand what climbing partner uh, or climbing group that you went with. You know, typically uh, these people have maybe 40 people, 20 to 40 people in their, their climbing parties. And you pretty much did things, you know, that not a lot of people want to take that risk and, and go out there and do that. So why did you decide to do it that way? Was it kind of a financial decision uh, in that moment? Or how did you see that? Yeah, I mean, finances is definitely a factor, but I didn't want to risk my life based on that. I figured my life would be worth an extra ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. But my experience with guided groups in the past, like you were saying earlier, yeah. there's always one or several weakest links. The reason that I was 1,000 feet from the summit and pretty much every time that I've been on Denali, you know, is because someone in the party, it was, you know, there was just certain factors where we had to make good decisions. And it's, you know, on the mountain, any, any day that you decide to go back down and survive, it's a good decision. Yeah. Um, but on Everest, I just, it's, it's a different type of mountain. It's not, you're not roped up to other people. You're one with the mountain. So I, I solo, you know, all the mountains here in the Cascades. I solo Aconcagua. 
Um, I'm very comfortable in that scenario. So I have that experience. Um, and I was sharing base camp and facilities like with Dave Hahn and RMI's group yep. down lower. But, you know, once you're on the mountain, I mean, you're, you're on your own. It's, a, it's an interesting, you know, just climbing in the Himalayas. It's, it's very unique. It's, it's pretty amazing because you just have that solitude, and a, you know, a ton of downtime, but a lot of time to think. And when you're in the death zone and, you know, above camp too, man, it, life is in slow motion. Hey, this pod is sponsored by Laird Superfoods. So many products to choose from, from your InstaFuel, your coffee, your tea, your smoothies. And I love the superfood creamer and use the hydration powders like the beets, the coconut, the matcha, the turmeric to mix all into my seven summit smoothie. And it's so good. Log on to LairdSuperfood.com and get your 20% off when you use the code MARKP20, okay? So get your layered superfood, and I guarantee it will help fuel your journey. Well, let's talk about slow motion for you. Okay, so uh, just like a lot of these guys now have returned home, there's a lot of tragedy, as we both know. And you get up there uh, this couple years ago, and now you've you know been doing the up and down, back and forth to get acclimated to what you have to endure once you get up high over 26,000 feet. And now it's summit day. And you're up there and you're going to climb with one other Sherpa. And, and so my understanding is that you get to around 1,000 feet. So this is probably 28,000 feet-ish uh, or so. And now your climbing partner, the guy that's supposed to get you to the top and, and come back. And by the way, I also heard on another video, like this mess that everybody's seen, the famous, the infamous uh, uh, Instagram photo with this like, carnival like line type thing going you know from the hillary step all the way to the summit i'm mm-hmm. just all stacked on each other that was not your situation so you're 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 solo you're with this one other sherpa you're at 20 28 000 feet what happens yeah it's just myself and pasong we're good friends today you know sherpa are real people they're very human you know they're they're strong everything else but in the death zone it's It's all survival. Um, He wasn't feeling so well. In fact, I got up to the balcony at 27,500 feet like an hour before he did. And I sat there and waited through the middle of the night. He showed up, wasn't feeling well, decided he wanted to continue. Strong guy. He already has two summits. And we continued moving up. And right below like the South Rock Step, which you get up um, above that, it's the South Summit. He just tapped out. He was done. He said he was going to go back to the balcony and wait for me. And, you know, we'd been climbing together for a month at that point. You know, I was strong and feeling well as a, you live and die by these decisions. You know, everything at the time was great. I didn't have, like you said, I didn't have the experience that they're, they're posting today. I mean, I had the mountain to myself and, you know, he went to the balcony. I continued up, you know, we didn't, you know, argue anything else. It was just, it was the right decision at the time. He ended up going all the way down to high camp because he wasn't feeling well, which makes sense. You got you to gotta take care of yourself. I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. And I continued up at that point. So when you say you didn't know it at the time, were you guys not radioed, you know, connected in that way? No. No, and there's a bad choice of words, but there's a dead zone between yeah. that area and the South Summit. Yeah. There's a lot of time where, yeah, there's just no radio communication. Yeah, okay. All right, so now... All right, so he's decided to go back down to camp for high camp, as you described, and now you've decided to go for the top, right? Mm-hmm. So off you go. And like most of the mountains, of course, I've never been on Mount Everest. Hopefully, I'll be able to experience that next year. But most of the mountains that, that I've been on, you know, it's fairly obvious. Um, and in this case, there might even be fixed lines going all the way to the summit. So you're mm-hmm. hooking yourself in, um, obviously, for safety reasons, but also to help guide you up the mountain. Um, and so off you go and now you land on the summit, right. And, and, and what happens from there? Yeah. If, and like you said, there's fixed lines, so ropes attached, you know, to rock and ice. If I didn't have those fixed lines, the decision to go up would have not to been go, you know, not to go up because I had not been up before, but it was, it is an obvious route. Um, up top, they don't really clean the ropes as much, so it's it's a dreadlocks of ropes. So you really have to understand, you know, which what is the right one to clip into. Yeah. You know, and always having two two clips and a sender and a, a safety. Yep. So it made it to the top, and yeah, like you know, hopefully you'll see next year 
the, those last steps, it's unlike anything else. It's that lifelong dream. And um, you've probably been here in the NFL in different aspects of your life. But when you reach this massive goal and you're expected to process it in that moment, you know, it's, it's impossible. But you find yourself, you know, life is moving slow, everything else, not a lot of air. You're, I was trying to just really just bring it in. Like, I'm here, you know, and I'm welling up, you know, crying and just, you know, made a radio call down, let everyone know I made it. But you can't stay long. So, you know, within, you know, a few minutes, however long I was up there, I uh, got all my stuff back together, turned around and started moving down the mountain. And within about five feet. So wait, 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 wait. Before you get within five feet, I want to, I want to stop you for a minute. So yeah. um, a, a couple things that, that came to mind. So number one, uh, I want to go back to this story of Don, Don Cash. And he's the good gentleman that I roomed my teammate with down in Antarctica. Yeah. And, you know, so I was following his journey going up the mountain. I was tracking them on a, on a GPS uh, Garmin um, device and then also on Facebook. And it's, it, it appeared that he made the top. And, uh, and, and so somebody was on Facebook, one of his buddies, and, go, and they were all congratulating him. He'd made the top. And they're all, and you know, because you have a lot of experiences, and I know whenever I get to the top, it's different from when I, when I was in college at the University of Washington or playing in the NFL when you're catching the last second touchdown. And it's, it's so in the moment, you don't know, and then the crowd goes crazy. And, and it's just a different uh, euphoria that you have versus climbing to the top. And the reason why I bring this up is because I looked at that comment, like they were congratulating, way to go, he's such a stud, all this stuff. And you're only halfway there. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're only halfway there. And I've climbed with this guy and I know what you probably... He was like 18 hours into this and he hadn't mm -hmm. made the top, right? And so, and the reason why I want to say this is because, you know, yes, I have been on a lot of these different mountains, but it's a slow, methodical process that you've been going through months and months and months of training. And then you get up on Everest like you did. And, you know, a couple of months up there, you're away from friends and family and everything else. Now you've like gone through the entire night. You've been up for 12, 14 hours. You've had to fly a headlamp. And, and you finally make it, and it's like this big sigh of relief. But then you got to like suck it all in again because now you got to figure out how you get down. And every single time I'm going down, I want to consciously say to myself, like, okay, you got to get down. Now is not the time to like check out and fall mm -hmm. asleep and trip over yourself. And I've seen that with other people. So, again, I just wanted to interject with that thought just because yeah, it's so important. True. And the other part that I wanted to ask you is like, it'd be really. I, the words coming to me is bizarre, but I don't think it's bizarre, but it's just surreal. Maybe that's a better word where on each one of these mountains, I've been up there with other people and we're high five and we're giving mm -hmm. each other hugs and there's pictures. Hey, give me this. And when you're up there on the, the, the tallest mountain in the world, what is it? 29,000, something. Mm -hmm. And, and you're literally by yourself on top of the world. I mean, mm -hmm. you're probably one of the only guys, like you said, the top three guys in the world right. who've ever experienced that type of moment. And there's nobody else to like celebrate that with or high five. That must just been like, I don't know if it's surreal or eerie or what that word would be for you. Yeah, it's, it's everything. You know, I made the radio call. So I kind of had a, a virtual celebration really quick, but yeah, I don't, I don't remember if I like fist bumped or, you know, like bumped my fist or what I was, I was just like so choked up and just trying to process it all. And yeah, it, it is, it is unique, but it's, it's just like, you can take a breath, you know, you're there, you can go no higher on this earth. And yeah, like you said, it's, I'm halfway there. And I'm, I know that most accidents occur on the way down because you're exhausted. And now you can actually see what you came up on the way down because it was all pitch black on the way up. But yeah, it is it, without anyone being there. It was, yeah, it's surreal is probably the best, best way to describe it. Okay. So uh, this is where things went wrong for you like everything was going right 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 for the most yeah. part going up there um you had some goggle issues some other things like that but you got through that but now it all kind kind of comes back to, to haunt you mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that statement you just made okay now I'm, I'm, I'm turning around i'm starting to go back down the mountain and five minutes later what happens yeah like five to ten feet in i mean it was just immediate everything went completely white so I had the, the goggle malfunction the day prior on Lotse face. They cracked, ended up ripping an internal lens out, which didn't realize at the time, but probably cut their effectiveness in half. 
having blue eyes, just more susceptible to snow blindness. And that's exactly what happened. As soon as the sun came up, bounced off the ice, fried my cornea. And, and I'd never been sun blind before, but, or uh, snow blind. And typically it takes about 24 hours for you to regain your sight. And I didn't regain mine fully for a month and a half. So it was super severe. And with snow blindness, it's not like blind where everything's black. It's where everything is just bright white. It's like just having a light bulb an inch in front of your face. You cannot see anything. You can move your finger in front of that light bulb. You'll know something just moved. You'll see a shadow. But it, that's it. And it's just super, super painful. Okay. So how do you, I mean, so basically you're in a closet now and you're, you're blind and you're, and you've got no guide, you've got no Sherpa and you've got nobody else up on the mountain to help you down. And it's just you. And that is it. So, you know, the obvious question is what's going through your mind? Are you like, Holy, you know what, you know, how am I going to pull this off? Or, is your training from being in the Navy, being a, a, a rescue guy where you had probably had to deal with a lot of situations that were intense and not everything was perfect and everything was, you know, you had to improvise a little bit. I mean, what was going through your mind and for you to get yourself out of that mess? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I did, something I learned in the, the Navy was assess the situation. So I remember I dropped down, grabbed the rope, the fixed line that I was attached to and just exactly that what you just said. You know, I'm completely alone. I'm blind. No one's coming to get me. And, you know, I'm at the highest point in the world. I have to get up and move. And it was pretty much as simple as that. So in the Navy, being a, an air rescue swimmer, you know, they try to drown us every day. That was part of it. And it's, it's about staying calm in oxygen-deprived areas. So I was underwater, you know, people trying to take me down. I got it you know, use techniques to get control of them, get them above the water, get them hoisted up the helicopter and, you know, save lives. And I think a lot of that really, it did, came back. I mean, it's just, it's innate. Um, but just didn't overthink it and just got up and started moving just slowly, slowly, just both hands, just white knuckling, holding that rope, holding my, making sure my safeties were in, making sure I wasn't getting, because now I'm going down. If my body weight gets on pins the the two anchors with my carabiners you know it's really tough especially coming down like you know um hillary step and you know some of these these different um hazards that you have to go through so you know using my other senses but honestly i'm not normally blind so i, I tried so hard to use my eyes i just kept trying and it was i describe it as like breaking potato chips and put it in your eyelids you just you realize just how often your eyes are just like twitching and it's just super painful. And yeah, I was, I could feel like frustration coming in and I had to just keep compartmentalizing that. And the whole time I just, I felt this presence around me and I didn't overthink it. You know, it's just kind of like if you're in the room with someone, you close your eyes, you know, they're there. Yeah. It was kind of that same, just peaceful presence. And, you know, just, I never really thought about it too much. Just the fact that it was there the whole time. And it should have taken me about three hours to get down to high camp, and it ended up taking me seven. What time of day was this? Um, sunrise. Okay, so sunrise. So if theoretically it's clear, you 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 know, if situation was normal, you would have had a either a bluebird day. At least it's light out, so you're not using your headlamp. And for the listener, trying to describe this a little bit too, when you're going down on fixed lines, they they typically put them in segments. So, right. So explain that. So essentially what you're doing is it's not like one massive long rope, you know, that's 3000 feet long. It's, it's, they're, they're in chunks of every, every place is a little bit different, but it yeah. might be in 50, 60 yards, maybe a little bit longer, but essentially you're, you're hooking in and then you're going to kind of where it ends and then you have to re unclip and then reclip. And there's kind of a whole strategy and technique around that. But I mean, Again, if you're if you can't see the rope that you're trying to do, and there's other ropes that have been there from past years or whatever, it, it, it to me it would be just a, a heck of a challenge to just make sure that you're for sure anchored in before you unclip and clip again, and off mm -hmm. you go. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a struggle, and yeah, the the segments they they vary. You know, on the forty foot Hillary steps, going to be different than like smaller sections, and some are anchored into rock, some are anchored into ice and snow. 
And yeah, it's every time I would I'd try to pull the rope like to my face and, you know, try to see what color it was. And that was frustrating in itself. I just, you know, really just making sure I was, it was tight. And as you know, carabiners, blocking carabiners tend to freeze. Yeah. We're trying to deal with that with massive, you know, gloves and mittens, everything. So it was, it was frustrating. I was so thirsty too, just on this descent. I was just like, just dying of thirst. And I'd have to stop and like do the whole process of taking my oxygen mask off and finding my bottle and make sure I don't drop anything, yeah. get a swig, put it all back. So it was a long process. It was just, yeah, it was very, very frustrating. And I had to just, anytime I would get frustrated, my heart would just start racing and my breathing would follow. And I'd have to just stop, calm down, do what I have to do, figure out a reason to survive. Like I'm not dumb. I knew 99% I was not going to survive. Yeah. But I was going to do everything I could to get back home to my family. Hey, I'm excited to introduce our new partner of the pod, Cascade Mountain Tech, an outdoor brand from the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from, that offers a great selection of trekking poles. They're incredible. Super coolers, camp chairs, LED lighting, and much more. Right now, Cascade Mountain Tech is offering 15% off your first order by using the code FINDINGYOURSUMMIT15. That is, FINDINGYOURSUMMIT15 when you check out at cascademountaintech.com well look at when we all know that when you have a very powerful why people can do superhuman things and your why certainly was your beautiful wife and your two kids you may have more than that now but you have two and and so that i i have two girls as well and and i mean it's just i understand where that where that power comes from of survival and trying to make it down. And it does become, and people don't understand that, you know, when you're climbing, you, when you go up and you take these rest breaks, you know, there, you just don't sit down and that's it. You know, typically you sit and you got to put a heavier parka on, you take your gloves off, you're trying to take your pack off, you sit on it, you make sure that you're secure. Then, you know, there's all this stuff. So even though you're resting theoretically, as you know, there's a lot of stuff going on and getting the gloves on and getting them off. And like on in, in Vincent, I'm, I'm not here to pick on Don Cash, but, you know, he kept losing his gloves and ice axe and water balls mm-hmm. and stuff down the mountain just because, you know, that self-care of mm-hmm. sitting down and really being present about taking care of yourself and what you need to do to make sure that your body is fueled in the right way to keep uh, propel you up or down that mountain. And so it's it's a lot of work. So now... Were you on the radio at all talking to anybody down at camp saying, hey, listen, this is a situation and, and I'm coming and, you know, sending somebody up? No. No. In fact, when I turned, when I made my radio call, I had like turned the dial down. I actually spun the the code, like the frequency code. Yeah. So I couldn't even have got them if I wanted. Like I, I could have spent all day like trying to one code at a time, one frequency. But I, I pretty much put the radio away and I didn't pull it back out. Are you yeah. saying uh, you couldn't see it? Or you, you couldn't calibrate it correctly because you couldn't see it, or Correct. just yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would have been a challenge in itself. And I knew that when I had put it back in, I'm like, oh, oops, okay, I can get back to my frequency, yeah. not knowing like another few minutes I was going to go blind. So it's kind of like this, my own little perfect storm here. You know, I didn't have a massive line, but I had my own challenges, and they're stacking up. But I, I got to the south summit. And at that point is when I actually slipped and took a major fall down the summit and the, the rope shock loaded. And that was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. It's like going to go up to your roof, close your eyes and jump off. It's just hit, you know, head over heels, just tumbling down the rope shock loads and I'm upside down. Yeah. Otherwise I would have fallen for over a mile. Yeah. My oxygen is mask is ripped off. My bottles coming out and my heart is just going. I had to write myself and just calm down, grab that air, and then, you know, kind of side traverse over and got to a point at the bottom of the South Summit and Rock Step that um, Pasong had left an extra oxygen bottle because I was about to run out based on time and everything. I tried uh, putting the regulator on and it wouldn't work just for whatever reason. So I didn't troubleshoot all day. You know, it's not a complex system. Take one off, put it on, and then it works. It didn't. So for whatever reason, I put that extra oxygen bottle in my pack, 
reassembled mine and continued moving. And at that point got to the balcony and Pasong wasn't there. So I figured he must've went down. And I just remember being at that halfway point, like just being kind of pumped. You know, I made it this far, like the stuff up top is a little more complex. Yeah. This last section is just 20 pitches of repelling. Yeah. Like, you know, I can get down that. And then, you know, got a snack, got some water and started heading down, reversed my gear, was kind of repelling, wedging two fingers in my carabiner to create a friction. And 20 feet in, my mask just starts compressing into my face and I ran out of oxygen. So I, I ripped that mask off and just like dropped to my knees. I was like trying to suck in thin air. And at that moment, just, just prayed, just surrendered at that moment. I'd been climbing 33 hours from the day prior to that point, just completely wrecked. You know, I'd already lost 20 pounds, black eyes, everything just, just done. And just said, God, I can't do this alone. Please help. And just immediately just felt this, this energy come over me, just unexplained. I, it was like someone lifted me to my feet and I just had life. I, I remember the first thing I did was pull out that other oxygen bottle, put the regulator on, and I got a positive flow. And I remember just sucking in like five deep breaths and it was like fire entering my veins that like hurt. But I, I had life. And, you know, again, without overthinking it, put all my gear back on and started just bombing down as fast as I could, which is super slow. You know, I was just being careful, you know, yeah. trying not to pierce my legs with my crampons and, and eventually got to the ice bulge, which is about a quarter mile from base camp. And, you know, it was looking out, everything's just bright white and it's just painful and just, I couldn't see anything. It was just frustrating. And then out of nowhere, Pasong just hugs me. And he's like, Brian, you're alive. And it was just an amazing moment it was just uh, to, to know that I was alive. Like there was someone there and he helped me back to the tent where I collapsed and slept for about 15 hours. My eyes were just glued shut and just painful. But, you know, I was, I was around people and I was alive. Okay, so let me unpack a few things there. So incredible, you know, tale of survival on how you made it down in these awful situation. It was interesting that I saw a couple of videos where your wife and some friends had in their own world back in the States had felt some kind of, I'm trying to think of the word again, you know, it's like a calling or a message or a, what's that? Like a prompting? A prompting, yeah, where they were really called like something was not right and they needed, they needed, they, what was needed is for them to pray for you, to get you back on your feet and, and to keep going and for survival and to make sure that you're going to end this thing in the right way. And it's just incredible when, you know, you hear about these things all the time where people have just this feeling, this, this, I don't know if it's a superpower or what that, that thing is, but it's just a feeling that something's not right. And, mm -hmm. you know, they are called to, you know, kick their superpowers of prayer into high gear to help other people through their adversity and what they're going through. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really amazing. And then from your standpoint, the euphoria, the euphoria that you must have had on, on, getting re-energized in that moment when you've tumbled down your oxygen and things not working and now you've turned it back on you've like reset yourself and then as you described it fire going into your veins and kind of rising you back to your feet and really feeling feeling that divine intervention of god coming into your heart your mind your body your soul to get you back down and then all of a sudden you know the one thing that you wanted probably more than anything obviously beyond your your survival is to have somebody come up and hug you and guide you and grab you and take you back to your tent, knowing that probably most likely uh, that one, once somebody was there, your guide, that, you know, the chances of all this working out in the right way were now stacked in your favor. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's heavy. It was amazing to, to hear the power of prayer. I had no idea that was going on. Best friends, people, I, my wife, people I didn't even know that just knew of me and, you know, knew that I was summiting at that point, just had that prompting. Like it's, it, it's crazy. Cause now on this end of it, I've had to deal with, you know, PTSD of 
surviving and going through that. And over time, it's, you know, it's gotten a little better, but I, you know, I do my motivational talks and everything and it's, it still just hits, hits hard. And there'll be just times that just trigger things where I just, whoa, where did that come from? And I just lose it. But yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a crazy thing because there are 200 plus bodies on the mountain still. So like, why am I alive? Why? I just, it's one of those things I have to deal with my whole life. Yeah. You know, no, no, look at, I, 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 you know, that, that's always a great question. And, um, uh, there's a, there's a phenomenal movie Maru that Jimmy Chin was part of, uh, Conrad anchor, another guy. And there's a, there's a place in there. The whole, the whole premise of this movie is they go off to, to climb this, 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 this peak, this really intense ice rock i think it was called shark's tooth or something that had never been climbed before and so it took them a couple tries to pull this thing off they created a movie a documentary out of it but the net net is is jimmy chin got into an avalanche and and you know by all means he should have never survived and it was a thick powerful snow mass coming down the hill and he happened to survive this thing right on top and he came out and he just like sitting there like why me and and the same thing but i also believe that you know it wasn't just luck that put you in that position to make it back down you know you were put with some some unreal circumstances but really to me researching your story it is a a collection of all these things of growing up in southern oregon of climbing those peaks uh down in that region of coming up to the great state of washington where i'm from of being in the cascades running up and down tiger mountain a thousand times being in the Navy, being, uh, as you described it, being in a very stressed out situation where they're almost trying to drown you to, to uh, create that, that presence of calm. Those gifts that you were given all were leading up to this one moment in your life that I think got you across the goal line and back to your family and the things that were most important to you. And mm -hmm. so, so, again, if somebody else in your same situation with none of those things I just mentioned, that would be luck, I think. You just, you know, you close the gap of to not being that that three percent that doesn't make it off because of all these other things. You know, it's when preparation meets opportunity, and that's what you did. Yep, I think you summed it up pretty well. I that's appreciate my that. <laughs> so, okay, so look at uh, you're, you're okay. So I want to I want to make sure that we don't lose this um, in the whole story. So, you know, you you've come down, you've gone through this incredible ordeal, you've now survived it. You're in a tent, but you're still at twenty six thousand feet. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so, yeah, you do have your your Sherpa guide with you, but you still got to get down some pretty steep stuff and you still have to go through the Kumba ice field. And the bottom line is you can't see. Right. So how did this all play out? Did you get airlifted out from Camp 2 or Camp 1? No, no. I hiked the whole way out, like all the way to Lukla. But yeah, getting down. So, yeah, I passed out for about 15 hours and I kept waking up and I would like rip my eyes open and take selfies with my camera. I don't even remember doing that. People were telling me later and then I saw the actual pictures, which is pretty creepy. But then the next day, you know, I had to get down Lhotse Face, which is no easy challenge going up or down. And, uh, you know, I had Pasong with me, helping me and just uh, slowly moving down. Gravity was on my side, which can be good and bad. Um, you know, eventually made it, you know, over the rock band and everything, which is kind of complex. Got to camp three. And Garrett Madison was cruising up at that point. So we talked right there and then continued down. And uh, Garrett's a, you know, Garrett, right? He's yep. Garrett's been on the pod. He's a, uh, a climber guide, climbing guide for Madison Mountaineering. Yeah. Great guy. Super strong guy. But got down to the bottom of Lhotse Face. And down there is a little complex. Those are the first like ladders kind of getting across the Berkshrung. And then there's some open crevasses. So I almost stepped right in one. And one of the guys came over and was like, whoa, stop. And, you know, held my hand and walked me in to camp two. And from there, I borrowed a French Canadian uh, female who was climbing, helping, you know, or she was sharing our facilities, had her dial Joanna, my wife, and gave her a call. And just told her like, she's all excited talking and you know, with sat phones, there's a delay and yeah. I'm like, Joanna, hold on. I soloed the summit and I'm blind yeah. and then it cut out and I couldn't get her back. <laughs> so oh, I, no. I own the worst phone call to spouse in yeah. history. 
So I didn't talk to her till the next day. We got up early before the sun came up, got down to camp one pretty quickly. And then the, through the Kumu Icefall, it looked like a bomb had dropped apparently because a lot of the, a lot of the ladders and different areas that we had crossed, you know, it changes every time you go through. Yeah. Um, but it was like just almost wiped out to where we could walk right through a lot of the more sketchy sections, you know, where there was like four ladders tied together and stuff. So that was a blessing in itself. But, you know, there's nothing graceful about mountaineering, especially going across those ladders. Yep. And I was just hugging those things, like crawling across and just doing what I could to get across. It was, it was, a, uh, yeah, as you'll see, you get good at it. You get some confidence, but you never wanted to be overconfident. Try closing your eyes and doing it. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> do that. <laughs> no, I'll leave that to you. Uh, that's not something I need to take on. Um, so, wow. So now you come back and as you, as you uh, mentioned, you know, a month and a half later, you're obviously fired up and jacked to see your, your wife, you go to the eye doctor and they ultimately get you healed up. And, and now you write this book again called Blind Descent, obviously, you know, great name for what you went through. How long did that take you to pull that together? Because I've I've been tinkering around with the book now, and it's just it's just a, a very meticulous, long editing. Come up with all the content. It's not an overnight like, hey, I'm going to write a book. You know, it's a great idea, but hard to do. Yeah, it is. Um, climbing magazine was. I had a blog going with them, or they had a blog with me, whatever. During my climb, so I had like the description of everything I was going through documented. So that kind of helped. I used that as a baseline and then expanded, you know, beyond that. When I got back, I flew out to Nashville where um, one of my friends who was on a radio station here, one of the hosts knew one of the managers for a band out there and or for really, really big guy in the industry, Mercy Me's manager, Scott Brickle, flew out to his house. He connected me with my literary agent, working title agency. And then from there, they connected me with Tyndale House and, and at that point, then it gets really complex as far as if you have like a, a real publisher, if you're self-publishing, then, you know, you can outsource a lot of that. But a, a publisher itself, it's like writing, rewriting a book five times. Mm -hmm. So now you have like these professional editors and I'm, I'm just kind of a straight to the point type of guy. Like if I'm yeah. a direct book, it's going to be like 10 pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just yeah. me to it. Just, you know, went soloed, blind, survived. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a process. So it took probably, I don't know, maybe uh, four to five months once I started with the actual publisher. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. And it sounds like from what I, what I heard you say, you're out uh, on the speaking circuit. I mean, certainly this is a story that a lot of people would want to hear. I mean, again, I think you align perfectly with this podcast, people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And certainly not only did you find your way, but you found your way down the mountain and back to safety and back to your wife, back to your kids. And that was the most important thing. And there's a message in terms of grit, not giving up all these different things. And, you know, did I, maybe I, I don't want to spoil what you talk about, but I mean, it just seems those would be natural topics for you. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of companies may have some like strategic vision and they'll want to force fit a message into it and a lot of times that can come across as cheesy yeah and in most cases for me i can just tell my story and every single person is going to be impacted individually they're all yeah. going through something in their life and they can use what i did as some sort of baseline of you know, maybe how i overcame this how i survived to allow them to survive, you know, whatever it may be, maybe cancer, some sort of disease or divorce or financial, whatever it is. So I've, I've found personally, like if I'm not trying to like force fit it down a path, that it's, it's a lot more successful and people get more out of it. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you that's, I think it's really looking internal because everybody's situation is a little bit different than maybe, as you said, um, that person is not going to go scale Everest, but maybe their Everest is trying to overcome some you know, health, you know, issue that they're going through. But, you know, that's what it's all about. And that's the reason why we all like to be inspired. You know, I'm, I'm the same way. I like talking to people. And I also like listening to in various stories. And certainly, uh, for me being on this side of the mic, uh, now 107 uh, plus and counting episodes of hearing these incredible tales of people doing amazing stuff. It has been the biggest gift of my life. And for that, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. So where can people find you? Um, well, I have, I'm on every flavor of social media. 
handle is, is Brian C. Dickinson or BrianDickinson.net. Okay, great. And uh, we're going to put the show notes down, uh, the book, uh, Blind Descent. And uh, look, at, it's been a joy. It's been a pleasure. You're a stud. You've accomplished a whole lot in life and, and uh, you continue to do so and now inspiring others. So thank you again for coming on the pod. And, and I think everybody else is going to be um, much richer for you sharing your story. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. He is Brian Dickinson. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to another amazing episode of Finding Your Summit. Truly incredible people doing spectacular things in life. And I hope you were inspired just like I continue to be. Look, I am super grateful that you came in and subscribed to this pod and would be more than appreciative if you gave the show a ratings and review on iTunes. Trust me, it matters. And then also go share it with your friends, of course. Okay, until next week, go do something great. And remember, it takes a little more to make a champion. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because as you know everybody has their own summit that they're going after okay if you're looking to follow my journey you can find that through my social links on mark pattison nfl.com that's mark m-a-r-k pattison p-a-t-t-i-s-o-n nfl.com so until the next podcast just remember clear eyes full hearts and remember it takes a little more to make a champion so make it happen thank you bye